Sorry for that awkward start. Um, this is actually take two of this video. I did the entire video uh, earlier and when I went to review it, there was no picture. Just a bunch of uh, scrambled colors on the screen and there was audio, but I thought since this is a video, there should have been a picture. So I'm hoping this works better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it again. Uh, I don't love the sound of my own voice, so this, this isn't real fun. Uh, but hopefully you'll get a little more benefit from it being done right this time. But welcome to our study, um, our midweek Bible study. And if you're a, a member at uh, Lancaster, where I preach, um, hopefully you got the email that we sent out today uh, that has an attachment uh, with a handout that I would be using if we were teaching this face-to-face uh, -face normally. Uh, there's a little handout that serves as a guide to our study and has some places where you can take notes and that kind of thing. Um, so that came out um, in, in an email earlier, and I encourage you to look at that. Uh, if you're not a part of the church here, but are watching and, excuse me, would like uh, access to that handout, message me somehow by email or Facebook message, or however, and I'll be happy to send it to you, uh, email it to you. So give me your email address. Uh, but it is, I think, a helpful guide to what we'll be discussing. Uh, this series of studies is uh, entitled The Quest for Wisdom, uh, Life's Most Precious Commodity. And uh, a lot of this um, was part of my, my university course that I taught at OVU um, when I taught Old Testament wisdom literature. Um, uh, not the entire course, but a, a good chunk of it, and, and this part of the discussion is, is from that. Um, it's interesting, you know, university students pay hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars for this material, uh, and you get it for free, so that's a great thing. And uh, when they, they pay all that money, whether it was worth it or not, but uh, you're getting it for free. At least uh, you don't pay anything other than your time, which is also a precious commodity. So I thank you for tuning in. Uh, but <clears throat> I wanted to start out by thinking in terms of precious commodities. Uh, what is your favorite precious commodity? Um, I looked up that term uh, to sort of get a definition what is a precious commodity and uh, what I found said anything any useful or valuable thing usually bought or sold and then it made a list of examples uh, for instance precious metals and we might think in terms of a gold or silver or platinum something like that uh, but also a precious commodity could be uh, corn uh, or, or maybe my favorite one, coffee uh, or various kinds of grains. Anything that might have value and, and is usually bought or sold. Uh, but we're talking about something in this study that is uh, not really bought and sold but it is precious and it is valuable. So it has traits of, of a precious commodity. And uh, the Old Testament calls it chokmah. That's the, the Old Testament word for what we're discussing. The New Testament calls it Sophia. And now some of you uh, may have people in your family or you yourself may be named Sophia. Uh, but in the New Testament, this commodity is called Sophia. In English, we call it wisdom. All right, so the, again, the Old Testament word is chokmah, which is, I love saying that word. That's why I keep repeating it. Hebrew is so fun to pronounce. Um, 
Greek is boring by, by comparison. But chokmah, uh, this word occurs well over 300 times in the Old Testament. And so it's an important word. Um, more than 50% of those occurrences take place in three books. Uh, the book of Proverbs, which should not be surprising. Uh, when we think of wisdom in the Old Testament, we often think of the book of Proverbs. And also the books of Job and Ecclesiastes. That's where most of the occurrences of this word wisdom occurs in the Old Testament. But other places as well, for instance, in the Psalms. There's a lot of Psalms that are discussing wisdom and could be classified as wisdom Psalms. And this is not simply an, um, an Old Testament concept, of course. We find wisdom and wisdom sayings in the, in the New Testament. Um, the book in the New Testament that's most often associated with wisdom is the letter of James. Uh, and then, uh, of course, Jesus, in a lot of his teaching, uses wisdom type statements and, and illustrations and so forth. Uh, most famously in his great sermon, uh, the fullest account of it is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, he uses wisdom sayings throughout that sermon. And then probably the most famous part of his great sermon is the beatitude which, which begin the sermon. Blessed are uh, the poor in heart or uh, you know all the blessed sayings there at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. Those are wisdom sayings really. And Jesus taught using wisdom categories. And so this is a, a, a biblical thing, not just an Old Testament or, or New Testament thing. So um, we're sort of going on a quest, pursuing this idea of, uh, of wisdom. And again, uh, there is this, this handout that I created for this. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. If you open it up in, in that PDF file, there's three pages. Uh, it, it lists some passages that we're going to uh, address and some places for you to make some notes, answer some questions, and so forth. Uh, I encourage you to use that. But we're going to start out in one of the great uh, Old Testament wisdom books, Job. Uh, Job is uh, a fascinating book for a lot of reasons. Uh, but he asked the question uh, that, that really we're asking in the study, which is, where shall wisdom be found? Now, he asked this question in the 28th chapter of the book of Job. Uh, Job 28 is an example of a long wisdom poem. And he uses uh, sort of an amazing illustration to, to develop this in Job 28. And uh, I'm going to read down through that, uh, make some comments along the way. It is a lengthy reading, but, uh, but it's just sort of neat how he uh, drives us to the importance of wisdom and seeking wisdom and so forth. But Job 28, and again, we'll emphasize some things as we go through this, but, but listen to the colorful, uh, poetic way that he, he uh, discusses this. Verse 1, chap chapter 28 of Job. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from the ore. Now notice he's talking about precious metals and how man uh, digs in the earth to find them. Verse 3, man puts an end to darkness and searches out to the farthest limit, the ore, in gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing 
to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. Notice again, animals, wild animals, have not been to the place where they're, they're digging for this commodity. It's so deep in the earth. It goes on, verse 9, Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the stream so that they do not trickle and the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. That's how man pursues precious commodities, gold, silver, and so forth. But then a very important question is asked in verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire, gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. You see, uh, what Job is seeking uh, Wisdom is priceless. No precious metal, no amount can pay for it. So then he, again, he asks the question in verse 20, from where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It's hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it, with our ears. Then a very important statement in verse 23. God understands the way to it and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and he sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to man, listen closely, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. Well, in that wisdom poem, uh, you have really an answer to the couple of the questions that we, we started out with. There's, there's a definition of wisdom uh, that we'll develop more, but also the question is answered, what's its source? Where do you find it? Uh, but he just uses this lengthy, but very colorful and, and illustrative um, parallel with mining uh, to, to get us to think about it. That's a, that's a great passage when we're thinking about wisdom. It's something that has to be pursued and dug out and, and sought in the right place. Well, a, a couple of passages now from what we usually consider the, the premier wisdom book of the Bible, the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 3, there are a couple of verses, so it's a much briefer passage, that discuss this theme, Proverbs 3, verses 19 and 20. Uh, listen to these words. It says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. 
By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. So in this text, uh, we get a little bit more insight. Whatever wisdom is, and we really haven't taken time to define it yet, but whatever it is, it has something to do with creation. Uh, It's part of the creative process of the world. Um, And in, in this text, at least, wisdom is almost synonymous with God. Um, and one thing we see in, in, in this text, Proverbs 3, 19 and 20, is uh, a little bit more of a definition of what wisdom is. Now, a, a very helpful feature of Old Testament poetry is parallelism. Parallelism means you know, it, a word is used in one line And then in the next line, a a word is used in parallel with it. And so if we're struggling with the definition of the line, of the word in line one, we can look in line two and see a synonym in essence. And so in line one of this text, we have the word wisdom, which we're studying. In line two, we have the word understanding that's in parallel. So wisdom is understanding. Understanding is another way of expressing wisdom. And then there's actually a triple parallelism in this text because in verse 20 we have a third word that's in parallel and that is knowledge. So whatever wisdom is, uh, it has to do with understanding and knowledge. And all of them here in this passage uh, have have, uh, something to do with the creation of the earth. So the Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Uh, Important passage in this discussion that that we have. Um, The next one is a little bit later in Proverbs in chapter 8. Chapter 8 of Proverbs, beginning at verse 22. And uh, again, to me, a really interesting passage because of the way it discusses creation. It links wisdom and creation again. In fact, this particular passage, and it runs from verse 22 to to verse 36, is the Bible's only first-person account of creation. So what do I mean by that? If you, if you think back to the, uh, the creation account, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, all right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on and talks about God did this on day one and this on day two. So it's a third person account of creation, right? Uh, he did this, he did that. But what we're going to see in this passage in Proverbs 8 is an eyewitness account, a first person account, uh, the letter I, eyewitness. And, uh, and so I did this, I did that kind of language. And it's, it's a way of retelling Genesis chapter one. And it, again, it's poetry. Much of wisdom literature is poetry. And we have to keep that in mind as we interpret it. Uh, but the poetry here, it, it sort of personifies wisdom. That is, it makes it uh, into a person, speaks of it as if it's a person, wisdom of being a person. Um, You remember your uh, good uh, English lit classes and poetry classes in high school and college when you learned about personification. Well, that's a common technique in scripture. And here, wisdom is personified. That is spoken of as if it's a person, an individual. And so this text... Proverbs 8 sounds like the history of this person wisdom from conception all the way to adulthood. We sort of see that progression throughout this. So again, let's, let's read through this and make a couple notes about it. Uh, it begins just like Proverbs 3 did with the Lord. 
a little note about that. The Lord here uh, is God's personal name. Uh, his name Yahweh, or sometimes called Jehovah. Uh, this isn't a generic term. This is God's specific name. The Lord Yahweh is the way verse 22 begins. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. And now, O oh sons, listen, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. So again, wisdom speaking, telling his story uh, from, from beginning to throughout childhood and, and into adulthood. It's sort of the way the poem works. So, you know, in this text, we see that wisdom is not necessarily synonymous with God. It's something that God brought forth. And it again is... Uh, a part of the creation process. So wisdom is not eternal. Uh, it, it is something that God created, although it comes into being before the creation of the world and, and so forth. Um, what came first? First, earth, the earth, or wisdom? Well, this text claims that wisdom came first. And... Uh, and it's interesting at the end of that passage, notice how wisdom is described as an issue of life and death. So those who pursue it and find it have life and those who never find wisdom or who hate it uh, experience death. Um, so wisdom, what we're talking about, is an issue of life and death in Scripture. I love that passage in, in Proverbs 8. Just one more proverb, and then we'll close for this session. Uh, it's a brief one. In the second chapter of Proverbs and verse 6, note what it says there. For the Lord, again, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So whatever wisdom is, and hopefully we picked up a little bit of detail about the definition, but whatever it is, it is something given, granted by Yahweh, by the Lord. He's the one who gives it. And uh, again, in this brief verse, chapter 2, verse 6 of Proverbs, Notice what is in parallel with wisdom as we think of a definition. Wisdom is mentioned, and then in the second line, knowledge and understanding. So wisdom has something to do with knowledge and understanding. I want to reference 
three other passages maybe for you to look at um, if you want to study a little bit further on this. They're all in the Psalms. So three different Psalms are wisdom Psalms and they're also creation Psalms. They, they make reference to creation and uh, they have something to say about the Lord and, and wisdom and creation. So uh, I'm referring to the eighth Psalm, Psalm 8, Psalm 19, and Psalm 104. And if you want to maybe go a little deeper and further in this initial discussion, uh, those are three Psalms, 8, 19, and 104, that would shed additional light on this theme. What we'll do at the beginning of our next session on this is I've sort of summarized some thoughts on wisdom and its relationship to creation that we find in Scripture. And again, if you have the handout, you'll see uh, a heading, Summary Thoughts on Wisdom in Creation, and there are seven blanks there. So there'll be seven of these summary thoughts that we'll go through quickly. Uh, Pick seven because that's a good biblical number of completeness. It may not be everything about this, uh, but, but... seven important things and so that's what we'll start start out with next time and and then we'll move uh, into some other issues uh, but i thank you for being a part of this and hope it's an in- interesting study uh, interesting study to you now um, just uh, an, an additional note about this again this uh, the origin of this material was a college course that, that I taught for several years uh, to uh, you know 20 year olds, 21 year olds. Uh, and we started out sort of this way uh, with a general discussion of wisdom, what it is, where it comes from. But then we of course studied through these biblical books, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, several of the Psalms, and also the Song of Solomon. Uh, These are commonly uh, termed wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And uh, I'm not sure if we'll go that far in this, uh, in these videos. I'll sort of leave that up to those of you who are watching. So what I'm asking is, as we move along, if you want to go into a little bit more depth in some of these books, I'm happy to do that. It'll take longer. Um, Maybe there's one of the books that you want to spend more time in. Happy to do that. But I'll wait to hear from you. If I don't hear from you, uh, I I won't pursue that. But but, um, I'd be happy to do so if that meets a need and an interest of yours. Uh, But again, I I hope you're doing well. And... uh, praying for you and and your family and uh, hope the rest of your day is is filled with blessing and and uh, the pursuit of of wisdom and this precious commodity that comes from from our lord Uh, may his blessings be with you and may you share them with others uh, as you have opportunity we'll see you next time